rise, my soul, arise. Shake off thy guilty fears, the pleading sacrifice in my behalf appears. Before the throne, my surety stands. Before the throne, my surety stands. My name is written on his hands. He ever lives above for me to intercede. His all redeeming love, his precious blood to plead, his blood atoned for all our race. His blood atoned for all our race and sprinkles now the throne of grace. Five bleeding wounds he bears, received on Calvary. They pour effectual prayers, they strongly plead for me. Forgive him, oh, forgive, they cry. Forgive him, oh, forgive, they cry. Nor let that ransom sinner die. The Father hears him pray, his dear anointed one. He cannot turn away. The presence of his Son, his Spirit answers to the blood, his Spirit answers to the blood, and tells me I am born of God. My God is reconciled, his pardoning voice I hear. He owns me for his child, I can no longer fear. With confidence I now draw nigh, with confidence I now draw nigh, and Father Abba, Father cry. With confidence I now with confidence I now draw nigh, and Father, Abba, Father, cry. Good evening, everyone. I, I trust that all are doing well and you're having a good week so far. I'd like to continue, if we could, tonight in our Bible study of different uh, people in the Bible who made choices, some good, some bad. But before we do that tonight uh, and, uh, and pray together, let's, let me just mention a few announcements to you. Uh, tomorrow night we have our Zoom prayer meeting. We've been growing in number. Uh, Pray as you come on to that meeting. Uh, look to the Lord with us. We, we've been doing well in uniting in prayer and uh, having someone lead us in those prayers. Uh, so 8 o'clock tomorrow night, you'll get the link for the Zoom prayer meeting. And then on Friday night, the Hebrews uh, Bible study will continue, Lord willing. On Sunday uh, in the morning and again in the evening, our evening and morning services There'll be some inclusions from different ones of you and of course those that are participating with the children. And uh, we've been having a good time doing it. I trust that you have. I've uh, on occasion thanked the people that have been involved with it and every one of them has said, we like doing it, we like doing it. All have said that, all except one, doesn't like doing it but they do it anyway. I'm not that one, but I don't like doing this either. But. Uh, We've been, we've been blessed by it, by each part that people have taken, and uh, 
it's just been good that we can do this together and have an opportunity to worship the Lord. Father, we pray that you'll bless our time tonight as we look into your word, that you will minister to us, Lord, although we're separated in distance and not in proximity with each other at the church, we pray that the Holy Spirit will have his way and speak your word to our hearts. We again pray, Lord, for the situation at hand, that you will uh, ease the uh, pandemic and in so doing ease the restrictions. And Lord, we pray that this thing will go away and we pray that your name will be honored and glorified and that the purpose for it will be realized. Lord, you could take evil, uh, intended for evil, turn it around to redound for your honor and for your glory. And so we're believing and trusting that you're going to use and are using this tragic situation that we've been through to bring honor and glory to your name, to purify us, to draw us after yourself, to awaken souls and hearts. We pray for those tonight that are sick, Lord, that you will lay your hand of healing upon them. We thank you for what you've done for those from our church and keeping them and bringing them through these days. And we do pray, Lord, that your hand will be continually upon us and that your help will be ministered to us. We pray for those tonight that we don't know anything about, but they're in hospitals and sick beds, maybe people that we know or are acquainted with. But Lord, we pray for this city that you will stretch out your hand and give help and be merciful to us. Bless our leaders, we pray, as we go forward, and all, all the leaders of the states. We pray for our federal government, the task force. Father, just give them the help they need, and may your will be done. And may your name be glorified. We thank you for it. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. If you have your Bibles and you turn with me to the uh, 11th chapter of the book of Hebrews, I'd like to, I'd like to read with you tonight uh, about Moses' decision. Moses. Uh, let me just read some of those verses. The story, of course, the, the longer narrative is found in the book of Exodus. And uh, we could read like four, five, six, eight chapters from the book of Exodus. If you have the time to do it, read the story of Moses. But uh, it's uh, summarized somewhat here in Hebrews chapter 11, beginning with verse 23. By faith, Moses' parents hid him for three months after he was born because they saw that he was no ordinary child and they were not afraid of the king's edict. By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to be mistreated along with the people of God rather than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a short time. He regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as of greater value than the treasures of Egypt because he was looking ahead to his reward. By faith he left Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. He persevered because he saw him who was invisible, and by faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood so that the destroyer of the firstborn would not touch the firstborn of Israel. And it continues on in some of the other things that, uh, that Moses was known for and that Moses did throughout his life. But uh, those earlier verses, particularly, we read about his decision. It's interesting to note uh, at the beginning of the narrative in the book of Hebrews that, of course, Moses' parents are brought up, not by name, but Amram and Jochebed were Moses' parents. And it says they did not fear the wrath of the king. They hid Moses, not fearing the wrath of the king. It's interesting that when Moses grew up and made his decision and his choice, it says he did not fear the king's anger. Uh, that's in verse 26. Moses' parents is in verse 23. Then when Moses, he did not, Moses, when he grew up, he did not fear the king's anger. Uh, you know, it's not, always, it's not always so, but it's often so that like parents, like children. And I, I just couldn't help but notice that when I read it, his parents did not fear. Now, they had reason to fear the wrath of the king, but they didn't. Moses had reason to fear the king when he made the choice that he made, but he didn't. And it's, uh, again, just interesting that I, I, it seems to me, or maybe I would just like to believe that something was instilled 
in the heart of Moses uh, through the faith of his mom and dad that he saw even as a little boy and maybe reminded himself of it as he grew up and came to years, knowing the choice that they made, knowing that they didn't fear the wrath of the king, Moses made the same choice. Now, more is taught to our children by the parents and by the life of the parent at home than it is in the church. I thank God for Sunday school. I thank God for kids club. I thank God for vacation Bible school. I thank God for pilgrim camp. But there's more taught to your child, parent, at home, by your life, by what, how you interact with the wrath of the king, how you fit into society today, your demeanor, your attitudes, your philosophy of life, not only by what you articulate through words, but more so by the way that you live, is translated into the lives of your child and it builds the character, and I trust it builds the character of a godly man or a godly woman as it's reflected in you to them. Egypt is a type of the world uh, in, in the Bible. When you read of the children of Israel being incarcerated in a house of bondage, it's, uh, it's in that life of sin, it's in that worldly uh, environment. And as you read about Pharaoh, you can, uh, I guess by type, associate Pharaoh with being the devil or the enemy. Uh, any God-fearing parent who tries to raise their children in this world order knows what it means to buck the edicts of Egypt, of Pharaoh, in style, in philosophy, in practice. We don't walk according to the course of this world. We've come out of the world and we're separate. We're not to touch the unclean thing that he may be our God and we may be his people. We do not love the world or the things that are in the world. The world in Egypt and Pharaoh is an antithesis to the kingdom of God that he wants to bring us out of. Now, we're in the world, Jesus said, but we're not of the world. And that's, that's a stand that moms and dads need to take. And Amram and Jochebed did, not fearing the wrath of the king. We can't walk according to the course of the world. Everything the world enjoys, uh, you may not be able to enjoy, and you may be the only one out of those on your block or in your school or in your community. But God's people are a people that have come out of Egypt, and they don't fear the wrath of Egypt or the philosophies. They don't need to walk in lockstep with the world. In Romans chapter 12, in the beginning, it says, don't let the world conform you. Don't be transformed into the image of this world. Don't be conformed into the image of this world, but be transformed from this world by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So just as Moses, uh, the devil is out to destroy every promising child but godly moms and dads in partnership with God don't give Pharaoh a chance. And let me say that again because I, f I find that too many even Christian moms and dads don't seem, they, they, they get it, but they don't get it. Uh, godly moms and dads in partnership with God living under the direction of God's principles as delineated in his word by the power of the Holy Spirit, by the grace that he enables them to live. Those kind of parents who in partnership with God do not give Pharaoh or this world a chance, even though it seems as if Pharaoh in this world has all the advantages. I believe that with all my heart. I know the world is wicked, the world was wicked when Moses was a little boy growing up, when Amram and Jochebed were parenting their little child. The world was wicked. Egypt was no friend to God. And this world today is untoward towards God. Maybe worse than when I was a boy, maybe worse than when I was a parent uh, nurturing my children. I, I don't know. I, I can't quantify that. The world is wicked, always has been. That's why we've always been told to come out of it and not walk according to it, because it's a wicked place. 
But as God gives grace, he is able to keep even in, even in Egypt. God is able to make all grace to abound that we might have sufficiency in all things. We can live a righteous, godly life in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. God has the help for us. My kids went to school, so do yours. Uh, well, they used to. I, my kids knew people uh, in the neighborhood and in the community. And uh, I, I didn't fear. My wife, we didn't fear what our kids might be exposed to and what they might hear. Now, I, I'm not saying that you shouldn't go to private school or home school or Christian school or whatever. We didn't do that. We believe that God was able to keep our kids. And I still believe that God is able to keep our kids. If you don't have those choices where you can find another alternative, God is able to keep them in the midst of the wickedness. If he could keep Daniel in the lion's den and the three Hebrew children in the fiery furnace, if God can keep uh, Daniel in a place like Babylon and Moses in a place like Egypt and bring him through, and bring him to the place where he chose for God. God's able to do that in your home, with your family, and your children. You may not be in the majority. You may be one of the few, but as is often said, if God is on our side, or better, if we are on God's side, then who can be against us? Parents need to decide if they want their children to be popular, and succeed in Egypt or be bound for the promised land. You've got to make that choice. And I'm now, I know we're talking about Moses' choice, so we'll get there in a minute. But parents need to make that decision. Do I want my child to succeed here in Egypt? You know, you, you hear it sometimes. My son is this, my daughter is that. They, they do this, they do that, they do this, they do that. They've achieved so far. They've got all the money in the world. They've got three houses and they've got two cars and, and they're so popular and they're so... But they've, they're losing their own souls. Now, that doesn't ever seem to enter into the equation. Or oh, they're, they're doing great. They're doing great as far as this world is concerned, but how long is that greatness going to last? How long are they going to be in this world? There's an eternity that's coming. And I think that it'd be best that we plan for eternity and hold very lightly the things of this world. It takes backbone and grit to be able to stand in this evil world. Amram and Jochebed had backbone and grit. And they pumped into their boy, Moses, principles and truths in his very young formative years that I believe stood him in good stead. Parents need to be in charge, and not, not the children. There are a few verses in the Bible that suggest that too. It's one of them is in Ecclesiastes chapter 10, and verse 16, where Solomon, who was a king, who understood this kind of stuff, Solomon wrote, Woe to you, O land, whose king is a child. Hey, parents, if your teenagers are telling you what to do, and, and if you're uh, living your home life and allowing or not allowing based upon your children being the king, oh, I, I don't want to hurt their feelings. Woe to the land whose king is is a child. Well, enough said about that. We, we want to get on to Moses' choice because family background is not enough. It counts. It's good to have a godly heritage. It's a real privilege and a blessing if you've had one. But it's certainly not the end of the story. It's certainly not enough. It can lay the groundwork, it can lay the foundation, as Paul writes to Timothy. Timothy, you've had a privilege that from a child you've known and were taught the Holy Scriptures. And then he uses these words, which are able to make you wise unto salvation. It's not a guarantee. It's not, well, your parents were following the Lord, so the kids are going to make the right choice and follow the Lord also. Every individual needs to make their own decision. It becomes a personal 
individual choice. Can I, can I uh, bias the choice of my family members? Could I influence their decision? Of course you can. My son is a Yankee fan. You know why he's a Yankee fan? Yeah, because I'm a Yankee fan. And uh, I could say a lot of other things about my kids. My one daughter, my oldest daughter, became a nurse. You know why she became a nurse? Yeah, there are maybe a lot of reasons, but one of them is her mom was a nurse. There's an influence. There are patterns. And uh, you see that all over the place in the way that your children take on certain characteristics or traits or order their homes and their lives. Yes! The input of the family counts, but there needs to be, and especially along spiritual matters, that individual choice. So Moses chose. He chose uh, in, in two different fashions, if I could put it that way. There was a negative and a positive. He, he refused, this is the negative part, uh, he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to suffer or lay the pleasures of Egypt aside and uh, to forsake Egypt itself. That was the negative. I don't want Egypt. I don't want all the pleasures of Egypt. I don't want all the things that Egypt has to offer me. That was a choice that he made on the negative side. On the positive side, it says uh, in the 26th verse that he chose to suffer affliction with the people of God uh, and esteem the reproach of Christ far greater treasures than the riches in Egypt. Now consider those decisions that he made. He refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Uh, wasn't a very smart choice, outwardly speaking. He was the only the only free living in Egypt, he was the only free Hebrew at the time. The only free Hebrew that we know of. Every one of his kinsfolk were incarcerated uh, by Egypt and servitude to Pharaoh. He was the only one that wasn't. It's even a lot more than that. When you just begin to, and I don't want to even take the time, but think of all the pleasures of Egypt that were afforded to him. There were some very uh, wrong pleasures of Egypt that were afforded to him, sinful pleasures of Egypt. There were also some very good pleasures of Egypt. The, the food that he was fed, the clothing that he was dressed in, the advantages he had to uh, get a good education. You want to grow up in a good school district? Well, then go to move into Egypt. But he chose against everything that Egypt had to offer him. Josephus says, <coughs> not in the Bible, but Josephus says that Moses was next in line for the throne in Egypt. And he forsook it all. He threw it all away. Now you'd look at Moses outwardly, naturally speaking, and say, man, he's a fool. I mean, who's he getting his financial advice from? Where, where, where's he learning to make decisions? A choice? Well, yeah, he made choices, all the wrong ones. I wouldn't have done that. I would have chosen, uh, well, I, I would have chosen, you know, the women, the wine, and the, the rot of Egypt, but I would have chosen all the good stuff and stayed right where I was and just not do the bad things and just enjoy the good things. Moses thought differently than that. I, I trust that you think differently than that too. He had everything and then some, yet he cast his lot with a nation of slaves. <clears throat> uh, 99% of the people, not, not, not in the church, of course, not you, but people that you would interview, and if you would put this in front of them and say, okay, now what choice would you make? I, I, would, I would say 90, 90, 95%, 99% would say, well, it's a no-brainer. I'm choosing Egypt. But I would suggest that Moses made the right choice. He made the right choice in his refusal for Egypt and the pleasures and the things of this world. Uh, if you're gonna live for God, you have to refuse this world. It's found all through the Bible, but it's again in the book of Nehemiah, it's chapter five, in verse 15. Nehemiah said, so did not I. 
because of the fear of the Lord. Now that wasn't a servile fear. That wasn't a fear of punishment, of go, going to hell or of you know, getting bashed over the head by the Lord. That, that's not the fear. There was a holy reverential respect for the Lord. And Nehemiah says, I'm not, I'm not casting in with that. I can't go there. It's not part of what I want to be. And it's because of the fear of the Lord. Of course, the wise man said, it's the fear of the Lord that's the beginning of wisdom. In Psalm chapter one, blessed is the man that doesn't walk in the counsel of the ungodly or stand in the way of sinners or sit in the seat of the scornful. In other words, blessed is the man who gets out of Egypt. But he delights himself in the law of the Lord and in his law doth he meditate day and night and so on and so on. To go the way of the cross, you must say goodbye to the ways of the world. There is a cross. You take up your cross, Jesus said, Jesus said, you take it up daily. Every day you die to the world, Paul said, every day. I, I die daily. Jesus said, take up your cross daily. What, what am I dying to? I'm dying to Egypt. I'm dying to everything that it offers me, the good, the bad, the ugly, everything that Egypt has. I have, I have no interest in it. It doesn't enamor me. I don't want it anymore. I like what D.L. Moody wrote in one of his journals, or I guess maybe his only journal, but he said, I walked down Fifth Avenue in Manhattan today, and I saw nothing that attracted me. He went on to explain that there was a lot that he saw. There was a lot that, that uh, would interest most people, but he said, eh, it was all just glitter and glitz and glamour, and I really don't have an interest for that. Uh, D.L. Moody had one interest, and that was in souls, and the kingdom of God, and the salvation of souls. And uh, that this, that's the thing that he saw as his treasure. Well, getting back to Moses, you can't go to church on Sunday and live with the rest of the world throughout the week. You're either gonna be in the palace, Moses had to make a choice, either be in the palace or be out as a slave with the people of God. I can't, I can't be both. I can't live in the palace Monday through Wednesday and then go out in the fields with the people of God on Thursday through Saturday and you know, I'll decide what I wanna do on Sunday. And You can't do that. Jesus said you can't serve two masters. You've got to make your choice. You're either going to choose to serve God or you're going to choose to serve mammon or Egypt. And so Moses, I believe, made the right choice in his refusal. If you look at it just for the years of time alone, I would still make the case that he made the right choice. But if you throw eternity into the mix, it's a, it's a no-brainer. He absolutely made the right choice. See, I don't think denying the things of this world now it really hurts anybody. I think there are more pleasures right now, even if heaven were never promised to me, every Tornquist used to sing, it's been worth it all just having the Lord in my life. Uh, if there was no heaven, just knowing Jesus here on earth, just pleasing him and following him with the joy and the peace. and It's just a better life all around. I don't find that I've missed anything when I said goodbye to this world and took up my cross to follow Jesus. He was right in his choice to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy those pleasures of sin. We get in our comfortable cars, leaving our comfortable homes, going to our comfortable church when we used to do all of that, and sit in a comfortable pew, and it better be too uh, warm enough in the winter and cold enough in the summer, and it's gotta be comfortable. And we open up our hymnals and sing, let's sing number 87. To the old rugged cross I will ever be true, it's shame and reproach gladly bear and then we close the book and have no idea what that means or what we just sang and we don't know of any reproach that the cross has brought to our lives because we live good, comfortable, easy lives. Hebrews chapter 13 
I think it's the 13th verse where the writer says, let us go to him without the camp. That's without the, the community of anyone. Let's go outside of Judaism, outside of the, 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 the things that we've been brought up in and the traditions. And the, let's leave all of that behind and let's go out to him without the camp bearing his reproach. There is a reproach. You read of it here. You read of it throughout the scriptures. He would rather... Uh, bear the reproach of the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin. What is the reproach? What is that that we suffer for Christ? It's not that I had a headache yesterday. It's not that, uh, you know, something's happened that's common to, to everybody anyway. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12 says, Yea, all that will live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. There might be ridicule involved. There might be ostracism involved. There might be mockery involved. There might be loss of economic gain involved. There may be all of the above. All that will live godly will suffer that. You know, years ago, people used to mock Christians. I know we're mocked again today, but in a different way. They used to make fun of Christians, call them holy rollers. And, and uh, today... Uh, through the entertainment and industries and media. Uh, Christianity is raked over the coals and they're small-minded and idiots and uh, don't know up from down and uh, archaic bigots and uh, intolerant of and all, the other, all that other stuff that's thrown at the Christians. And by the way, I, I would make an argument that uh, very, very little of it is really true to the true, genuine Christian. Very little of it really sticks. But the world will say those things. And there will be many people that will cower in fear because of it. And I don't want to be labeled that. I don't want to be called to this. And I don't want to be called to that. And so I, I'm just going to, you know, forget about this. And I'll just walk with them. And I'll, I'll compromise where I need to. We need to recognize that there's a reproach if we're going to follow Jesus. That we're not going to be maybe the life of the party. We're not going to be the best friends of everybody. We're not going to be as popular as we might be otherwise. We may be. You may have all the other stuff included and still live godly in Christ Jesus. But oftentimes you'll find that there's a choice to be made. And you need to, you'll need to choose rather than to. And may God give every one of us the grace to choose as Moses did. He added up both sides. You know, Jesus tells us to do that. Uh, again, I have a hard time with this concept of, you know, you can't choose, it's all chosen for you, and so you're just going to fall into wherever it is that you're supposed to be. Jesus said, I think it's in Matthew 12, I may be wrong, but Jesus said, before you come and follow me, before you lay down your life and give yourself to me, I want you to count the cost. And I want you to see if you have what it takes. And if you're going to follow me, then really follow me. Don't just do it in name. Don't just do it in, uh, from your neck up and your brain. But I want your whole life. If you're going to live a life of faith, then you're going to have to serve and follow me with all of it. Not just part of it. And so count the cost. Figure out if you want to pay the price. And then make your decision. And... Uh, I guess in Jesus' day, people did. And some of them couldn't handle it. We read in John 6 that uh, when Jesus began to teach the people about eating his flesh and drinking his blood, this is a hard saying, who can hear it? And many of them from that day forward turned around and, and went back. Moses made his choice. The treasures in Egypt do not compare to the reproach of Christ. <laughs> I, I'd much rather choose the reproach of Christ. He looked at Egypt, he looked at Egypt's best, he looked at Israel's worst, and he chose Israel. Again, that, that's not a, a concept that could be understood by the natural mind. To the natural mind, the way of choosing the cross is foolishness or a stumbling block. I mean, this is not like surprise. The Bible tells us this. And we, we need to arm ourselves with that understanding. 
If you're going to follow Jesus, if you're going to choose to leave what looks like the best, to choose what looks like the worst, well, you need to make that choice. But as Moses goes on to say, he, he chose the reproach because he had respect to the recompense of the reward. He saw through into what's lying before. Egypt and this world is not my final destination, as we talked about last week with Abraham. It's not my resting place. I'm just passing through as a pilgrim. And Egypt, although it can offer me a lot now and I can get lost in it and lose my life in it, I'll also lose my soul in it. And what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? And so he made the better choice. And he chose to go the way of the cross. The psalmist, it's the 73rd Psalm. The psalmist says, I, I, I almost lost my way. My feet almost slipped off the rock. What happened? Well, I, I looked around at my life and I looked at everybody else's life around me. And I saw that all the ungodly people are prospering. They're living in Egypt and they're living it up in Egypt and they're having a grand old time in Egypt and they're looking askance at everybody and anybody that's a Christian, mocking them for their sincerity and faith in God, their fidelity to the ways of God. They, they think they're a bunch of dopes for doing what they're doing and living like they're living. And I'm beginning to think that they may be right because they got nice big gold chains around their neck and I don't have two cents to rub together. They, they're not sick at all, and I'm sick every day of my life. There are no bands in their death, I think is the way it puts it. They're healthy, they're wealthy, they're wise. They're living in Egypt. They're flaunting themselves at God and the things of God, and they seem to be getting away with it. And look at me. I've chosen this way, and it hasn't been fun, and it hasn't been easy, and it has been a reproach, to be sure. And then in the seven. 17th verse of that psalm, the psalmist says, oh, but then I went into the sanctuary of the Lord and I understood their end. Surely you have set them in slippery places. Oh, they have an end. They have an end. And then the, the psalmist goes on and he says, and Lord, you're always with me. When I thought the way that I thought, I was thinking as an animal. I was thinking with mere natural mind and instincts and I didn't consider eternity. See, Moses made the choice that he made, not because he was hungry for punishment and being beaten and enjoying slavery, but he made the choice that he made because he saw the recompense of the reward. And he made that choice as a young man. You know, young men and young women need to make choices, so do old men and women. But we make some keen choices in our youth. They say, they say that the three most important choices you can make are number one, to serve or to follow Jesus Christ, number two, your vocation, and number three, who you marry. And it's also been said, and I do believe it's true, that when you get the first choice right, the other two fall into place. It's kind of all-inclusive. When you choose to follow Jesus, when you choose to serve him, and I'm talking about like Moses did, when you really choose to follow Jesus, not follow him to a certain degree until it conflicts with what I want in my life and where I want to do and live and who I want to marry and what I, when you really serve and follow Jesus, when you leave the old completely, he directs, he leads, and there's never a lack or a loss. At the heart of Moses' choice was a person. He didn't choose to follow a group of people or another leader. He didn't choose to follow a philosophy he didn't choose to follow uh, because he was of a Jewish background and he wanted to stick with his roots. It says that he followed for the sake of Christ. For the sake of Christ, a person. 
You know, our, our faith is all wrapped up, not in a creed, not in device, not in a church, not in a religion. It's wrapped up in a person. We choose to follow the author and the perfecter of our faith. Not our mom's faith, not our dad's religion, not what my grandfather was, not the church that I was brought up in. We follow a person. And when you fall in love with that person and you recognize that person's claims on your life and what that person did to purchase you with his own blood and make you his own child, you choose the reproach of Christ far greater treasure than any pleasures of Egypt. You see the recompense of the reward, recognizing that one day, as Paul the Apostle said it, my goal is to win Christ. And so I'm going to run with all that I could possibly muster up to run with. I'm going to follow on. I'm going to strain and press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. I've started in the race, but don't you know that they that run in a race run all? Now run that you might obtain that prize. What's the prize that you're running for? Well, I want a big mansion over the hilltop with streets of gold. No, I want to win Christ. I've left it all behind for the sake of Christ. I count everything in Egypt but dung for the sake of Christ. And that's my focus. I want to win Christ and be found in Him, not having my own righteousness, but I want to have that righteousness which is of God by Christ Jesus. And so I follow on. So I press toward that mark for Christ. And finally... The greatest Christians are marked with scars. Now that's found in this story of Moses. It's found in the story of the Apostle Paul. It's found in the great example we have in our Lord Jesus Christ. These scars are not only physical, although Paul the Apostle talks about, he refers to the marks I bear in my body. It's in the book of Galatians. I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus Christ. But uh, it's not only physical. Sometimes there are scars. There's a price to be paid when you endure the affliction with God's people. Physical, yes, and in some places and in many places, and many places, unfortunately, in this world, our brothers and sisters are bearing the marks, the literal marks, the scars for the sake of Christ. But you need to count the cost and you need to be willing to pay the price. Am I willing to forego the pleasures of this world? Am I willing to forego the popularity or notoriety? If I have to, if I need to, you can be popular and you can be famous and you can still be a Christian. But there are many times that it becomes a choice between Christ and this world between Egypt and the people of God. Choose well, choose wisely, choose as Moses chose, choose as Abraham to be a stranger and a pilgrim, choose as Moses chose to come out of this world, knowing that one day you're gonna reap the rewards throughout the ages of eternity. In, in World War I, Teddy Roosevelt, uh, spoke of German Americans, and he he spoke of them in turn. They are people with divided loyalties. He said these German, some German Americans, have divided loyalties. They don't know if they want to be German or if they want to be American. Depends on who they're talking to, when they're talking to them, and where they are when they're talking. And he, Teddy Roosevelt, described these people as hyphenated Americans. Hyphenated Americans, he referred to them as that more than once. These hyphenated Americans, they don't know where they belong. They don't know if they're German or Americans. If you are an American, I'm quoting Ted Roosevelt, if you are an American and something else, you are not an American. America is not a polyglot boarding house, whatever that is. America is not a polyglot boarding house. If you are an American and something else, then you are not an American. 
Well, the kingdom of God is not a polyglot boarding house either. And if you are not a follower of Jesus Christ, totally and completely, if you are a follower of Jesus Christ and also a follower of some part and things of this world, then you are not a Christian. You can call yourself whatever you want, but Christians, followers of Christ, have made the choice to say goodbye, old world. I'm through with you. I'm on my way to Canaan's land. Don't make a mistake, you make the wrong choice. Eternity is too long to get it wrong. We thank you, dear Lord Jesus, for the example we have of Moses. No, he was not perfect. No, neither are we. You're the only one that is. But we thank you for the course that his life took. And we thank you tonight for the choice that he made. And we pray that you will give us grace day by day to choose Christ. When we're faced with those choices, and maybe many times a day, may we choose Christ. Oh Lord, may we forgo the pleasures and successes and taunts and calls of Egypt, and may we come out and choose to follow you. We thank you, dear Lord, that there's a reward. Keep it in our view looking unto Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith. Lord, this world is passing, it's transient, and we're just going through it, but we're heading home. And we do pray, Lord, that you'll give us grace day by day to follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful rest of the week. We'll see you again, Lord willing, on Sunday.